So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Space Coast Sunday morning service. My name is uh, Reverend Dr. Ron Fox, and I'm so glad that you're able to join us. If you've never been to a Center for Spiritual Living before, we believe there's one God, many paths to that God, and we're here to love, honor, and support you, no matter what your divine path is. And the Center for Spiritual Living Space Coast is a safe haven for people of all beliefs and lifestyles whoever you are, and wherever you find yourself on your journey of faith, you're welcome here. And to begin our service this morning, my wife Becky, who is a practitioner emeritus, will open us with a prayer, and then one of our congregants, Barbara Loftus, will do a reading for us. So, Beck? Mm. And so I just invite everybody to turn within to that place of joy, to that place of peace, to that place of love. And as we're doing this, just empty our minds of all this morning's activities and just be here, right here, right now, in this place of stillness, just knowing that God is all around us, that infinite possibilities are right here, right now. And so let's just allow those possibilities to emerge through us, as us, and for us, right here, right now. I'm knowing that each one of us is one in divine spirit, that it is who and what each one of us is. And I'm knowing this for Reverend Dr. Ron, that as he does this morning's message, he is filled with this wonderful divine possibility emerging through him, through his words, through his message this morning. It is filled with love. It is filled with wisdom. And so I'm knowing that as this morning unfolds, it is unfolding in divine perfection, that each one of us is here by this divine calling to hear, to listen, to feel, to know what we're supposed to know from today's message. And so for this and so much more, I give thanks, I let it be, and just know that it is all in the higher order. And so it is. So it is. Thank you, Vic. This is a reading from an excellent book that I received this week called Experiencing the Beacon Within, a guide to lead you back to your authentic self by a fellow named Ron Fox. Choosing peace. There is a fable that describes a king who offered a prize for the person who could paint the best picture of peace. There were two finalists. One drew a picture of peaceful mountains, fluffy clouds, and a calm lake. The other drew a picture of an angry sky, lightning, and a rushing waterfall. Behind the waterfall was a tiny bush growing from a crack in a rock. There sat a mother bird in her nest in perfect calm. The king chose the second picture. For reasons the anonymous author described, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of these things and still be calm in your heart. That, excuse me, Thich Nhat Hanh wrote about how people responded to the stress of crowded refugee boats when they encountered storms or pirates. He said, if everyone panicked, the boat would capsize. If only one person remained calm and centered in God, that was enough to save everyone. What a wonderful example of how powerful our faith can be. Not only do we affect our own life, but the lives of everyone around us. When we choose peace, we experience God. No matter what appearances, appearances seem to be, deep within, we are calm and serene because we know all is well and life is unfolding as it should. Thank you, Barb. And I have to say, 
That was the best reading I've heard in years. <clears throat> Just teasing. So this morning, my, my title is Be the Change. And a lot of my colleagues I know this morning are gonna be, gonna be speaking about peace in relation to the election, but that isn't my focus. I, I, I chose this topic because of the pandemic. Be, because, um, you know, we have a small center and, and I, um, I try to call people every week, that, as many as I can. And this last week, I, I saw and spoke to people that are really upset, really in fear, really, really feeling depressed. And so I, I want to address that, you know, and, and, and to be honest, just one more piece of bad news. It's not going to get better for a while. Last night, uh, um, there were 134,000 new cases. And, and so we need to be able to deal with it. And, and, and I really believe this, that this could be a time of opportunity and growth for us. And that, that's what I, 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 I like, like you all to see, you know, how often in life have, have you made, have any of us set an intention and then went out and sabotaged it? Like, like have you ever committed to eating healthily and then go out and buy junk food and at the same time you buy the vitamins that you're never gonna take. I bet if I could see you, you'd all be saying, yeah, I've done that. I've, I've done that. You know, Ernest Holmes tells us that, that we, we do that because when we think about something year after year after year, we, we tend to perpetuate the situation. It, what begins in consciousness then goes into subconsciousness. You know, change, I know it's difficult. I mean, how long does it take most of us to break our New Year's resolutions? Because it's way easier to stick with comfortable patterns. Um, there, there's security in, in what we know. And, and, and to make it worse, you know, sometimes friends and family members that really mean well um, discourage us from stepping out and trying a new behavior and a new pattern in, in our life. So, so there are there are many many factors that pull us back to to what we're doing, but we can take heart. We can take heart in the fact every one of us has the power to change when we are really determined. The universe will will come and be with us, and and universe, I mean God. God's power is limitless. We don't need a stronger power. What we need is a stronger consciousness. And it's not easy to, to develop a new consciousness. But when we're willing to do this spiritual work, we will see new results. You know, most change, most change is, is incremental. So even if you're getting small changes, celebrate, celebrate the small changes and know that with prayer, with study and with time, what you're seeking, you will find. Eleanor Roosevelt once wrote, the future is little, literally in our hands to mold as we like, but we cannot wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow is now. And you know, sometimes what motivates change is a wake up call. You know, we, we get a divorce. We get laid off from work. Uh, we get sick or somebody we love gets sick. We, we, um, we lose a friend. And, and this time, this COVID-19 time, that could be the wake up call. This could be our opportunity to go within to, to grow, to, to expose our gifts. You know, like, like the Talmudist said, if not now, when? So I want to tell you a fable. And here's the fable. Um, the angel of death comes to take a saintly man. 
And, and God says to the angel, he was a really good person. Whatever his last wish is, grant it. And so his wish is for God to retire the angel of death so people could live together in peace and in a predictable world without change. And so, so his, wish, his wish is granted and the earth comes to a halt. Seeds can't die, so there's no new growth and no new crops. The white clouds can't release their rain, so the earth is dry and parched. And night, from where the new day comes, uh, went into exile, so there was constant day. And soon, the, the starving people became hollow-eyed. They became desperate. They became imprisoned in perpetual misery. And, and the saint's wish, this lovely man, his wish had created this misery. And he became overwhelmed with, with regret because he realized that attachment to what is, no matter how wonderful, stops the, policy, the, the possibility of new creation. He, he realized that, that death is the mother of life. So he begged the angel to, re, to return. So, so I, I shared a fable because for me, it's, it's not just about dying and being in the ground. To me, this fable has a broader meaning. It's, it's about the death of a way of being, the, the death of, of limiting thoughts and, and beliefs. Joan Borisenko, who's a spiritual writer, uh, in one of her books, she describes her favorite cartoon which is um, captioned, a man about to meet his destiny. And so visualize this. The cartoon is there's a fella happily walking down the street and around the corner is a gigantic rhinoceros galloping towards the intersection where in a moment they'll both meet. And Joan says, Life is like that. Change is going to happen. Sometime it's, sometimes it's going to be huge, and sometimes it's not going to be. But all of change has, has the potential to be difficult. So Pema Chodron, who I've spoken about before, is a Buddhist nun. And in one of her books, she says, resisting change is called suffering. Resisting change is called suffering. She said, when, when we stop resisting, we open the door to our true nature, which is our own fundamental goodness. And she said, that's called freedom. Freedom from struggling against the fundamental ambiguity of being human. I love that. It's freedom from struggling against the fundamental ambiguity of being human. In the Tibetan book of living and dying, Soigal Rinpoche writes that there's only one, one law in the universe that never changes. One law in the universe that never changes. And you know what he says that law is? He says, it's that all things are impermanent. That never changes. All things are impermanent. And he says, when, 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 when we believe things are permanent, we shut off the possibility of learning, of learning from change. And he said, if we do that, we grasp. We grasp. And he said, grasping is the source of all our problems. And he said, the irony of it is that, that it's impossible 
the irony, the struggling to hold on to everything that is, is impossible. And that's what brings about the pain we're trying to avoid. So let, let me give you an example. So I, I think in the past I've spoken about Tama Keys and um, Becky and I got to meet her. She's a terrific speaker. And, and so at one point in her life, she was a very highly paid uh, attorney and she was a graduate of Harvard University and she had this terrific job. She, she writes that she had all of the toys that anybody could want, but she hated her job. And it caused her to, to go into depression and, and to shut down. And she said, I hated my job, but I wasn't willing to throw it away because I didn't want to throw away all of that security. That is until she got to a point of not wanting to live anymore. She actually got to a point where she started to wish that the bus that she took to work every day would just crash and she would die. And so she quit her job. And she said, I always wanted to be a writer. And her mother who didn't want her to quit her great job told her, well, you can write on weekends, but, but that didn't work for her. So she said, I began to listen to my inner voice. And she said, so today I'm an international speaker. I'm a retreat facilitator. I'm a life coach. And of course, of course, she's an, she's an author. And so her, her desire to write for her was an invitation to trust and to complete herself. It was an invitation to live her calling and, and to live and trust her joy. You know, Ernest Holmes said that the will of God is everything that improves life without hurt. And so here's, here's what he, a quote from Ernest. He said, anything that will enable us to express greater life, greater power, greater happiness, so long as it does not harm anyone, must be the will of God for us. So if you've got a yearning, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but if you've got a yearning in your heart, he's saying that God put that there. And that's, that's God's, if that's your will for you, that's God's will for you, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. And think about this, he, he said, just think, if, if God put it there, then you've got a way, there's a way for you to bring it to life, to manifest it. Because he said, what kind of God would it be that would give you this will and not give you that way? That, that would be a cruel God. We don't believe in a cruel God. You know, in, in the Bible, when Jesus talks about not putting new patches on old clothing or new wine into new containers, what, what he's saying, he was teaching us that, that we're always living a new life and that the, the, the new and the old don't, don't always mesh, don't always mesh together. And so we, we, we need to discard one and move on. And he said, you know, don't discard everything that's good in the old, but what's not, what doesn't serve, we need to discard that. And, and you know, there, there is no limit to the possibility that's inherent in all of us. You hear that? There's no limit to the possibility that's inherent in each and every one of us. And, and, and we, have, we, we have a power to help us there. We don't have to do this alone. You know, when I, I think sometimes that when we hear things about, about God, we go, yeah, 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 and it's like we know it, but, but listen to this. The, the power, the power that created the sun, the power that created the moon and the stars and the mountains and the ocean, that power is right here, right now, along with us. Wherever, wherever we are, that power is, and that power is just awaiting recognition to move 
into our lives. And so let me give you two, two examples. This first one I just read about yesterday in Sports Illustrated. And it's about a young lady named Anastasia Pagonis. Anastasia is a champion swimmer. And she had star, star guards, star guards disease. Star guards disease is a progress, a progressive eye disease. And so in 2018, at the age of 14, she went blind, totally blind. And she gave up on all her dreams. She didn't see the point in living anymore. She stopped swimming. She couldn't eat. The only thing that she could get down was, was one um, shake a day. She was suicidal. Her parents sent her to therapy. And somewhere along the way, she had the revelation that if she was going to get out of the funk that she was in, it had to come within. A 14-year-old recognized if she was going to get better, she had to go within. So that's what she did. That was in 2018. In 2019, she began to swim again. Since then, she's won all kinds of gold medals. She's actually better than ever. And she's been invited to try out for the United States Paralympic team. All of that because she went within to find her power. So let me give you example number two. Donald Curtis was a, he's gone now, late Donald Curtis, was, was a uh, religious science minister. And in his day, he was a famous actor. He was in all kinds of movies and, and all kinds of uh, TV shows. And he writes that, that one day a woman came up to him after his service and he looked at her and he said, you are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. And she thanked him and she said, you know, I appreciate what you said, but I'm not beautiful in the classic sense of beauty. And she said to him, uh, in fact, when I was growing up, my family called me the ugly duckling and they were ashamed of me. And I was embarrassed at how I looked. And somewhere along the way, I decided I had to do something about it. So she said, I looked in the mirror and I decided I had to do it if it was going to be done. So what she did, she looked in the mirror every day and I would, she would say to herself, I see a beautiful face. She started to pretend that she saw a beautiful face in that mirror. She said, every day I would look in it and I would say, you're beautiful, you're kind, and God is shining through my face. And she said, after doing that a while, people started to compliment me. A couple of men said to me, I was beautiful and I began to act differently. I was nicer, I was kinder. And finally one day I saw in the mirror the face that you see today. And she said, so I want you to tell your audience that you saw the beauty of God shining through an ugly duckling. And Curtis wrote, he never saw that woman again, but he never forgot her example of what you can do when you recognize the God within. Eckhart Tolle wrote, 
one thing we know life will give you. But one thing we know life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. And then he says, how do you know this is the experience you need? Because this is the experience you're having at this moment. So I want to I want to tell you, and I, I've done this before, one of my favorite quotes that I have ever read. And it's a quote by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. He wrote, in the eyes of the world, I am average. But in my own heart, I am of great moment. The challenge I face is how to actualize, how to concretize the quiet eminence of my own being. I'm going to do it again. In the eyes of the world, I am average. But in my own heart, I am of great moment. The challenge I face is how to actualize, how to concretize the quiet eminence of my own being. I bet a lot of us know what that means. You know, that whatever the world sees, whatever the world believes, we know that we have more to offer. We know that we have more to give. You know, each one of us is a, has a spark that's, that's waiting to be lit. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you nurture and, and develop? You know, Rabbi Bywin Sherwin said, the, the aim of life is to end up with a more beautiful soul than we begin, began with. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. And so I want to close with these words from Don Juan to Carlos Castaneda. A warrior must activate the feeling he has everything needed for the extravagant journey that is his life. What counts for a warrior is being alive. Life in itself is sufficient and explanatory and complete. Therefore, one may say without being presumptuous that the experience of experiences is being alive. Thank you for being here. God bless you and have an absolutely wonderful week.